All right, time to go teach. Hello and welcome to this next episode in our unit on genetics. We are looking at meiosis, which is the formation of gametes. So here we go. That's our goal. It's describing the path that chromosomes are going to take. How do chromosomes get separated in this process of meiosis? And we're going to also introduce a little bit of vocabulary. Meiosis, there's two stages to it. The first set of stages might sound very familiar if you remember the cell cycle and remember mitosis. So meiosis has meiosis one. Prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one. Very straightforward, but the way that you can tell that this is meiosis and not mitosis is because it is prophase one. The moment you add a numeral means it is meiosis. If we only said prophase, then that would not mean meiosis at all because meiosis doesn't have prophase. It has prophase one. And the second stage of meiosis, meiosis two, has prophase two and metaphase two and anaphase two and telophase two. Mitosis has prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Meiosis has prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two, in that order. So they are very similar in what happens, but the names are going to tell you which thing we're talking about. Prophase one of meiosis one is where the nuclear envelope is going to dissolve. The chromosomes are going to condense. Now this is different. This is something new. The homologous chromosomes are going to undergo a process called synapsis where they are going to come together and actually form basically a joining between the homologous pairs. And a process called crossing over is also going to occur. And then lastly, our spindle apparatus is going to form so that way our chromosomes can get moved to where they need to get moved to. We're going to take our cell and our cell here has four chromosomes. And of these four chromosomes, we have a homologous pair right here and a homologous pair right here. So we have two pairs of chromosomes within our cell. Our cell is a diploid cell. Each of the pairs of chromosomes have the same genes. So these two chromosomes have the same genes and these two chromosomes have the same genes, but they have different alleles. They are going to form a tetrad and this would be a tetrad as would this. So now our homologous chromosomes have joined together, crossing some of their sister chromatids across each other. We, we call this a tetrad because it is made up of one, two, three, four sister chromatids, and tetra means four. So because we have four different sister chromatids put together now, we happen to have this formation of a tetrad. And that is, happening in this process called synapsis. Crossing over is going to involve where the chromosomes actually cross. This location has a special name. It's called the chiasma, or singularly would be the chiasmata. And at that location where the different sister chromatids from the homologous chromosomes are crossing, they are going to actually swap their genetic material. So right here, these alleles are going to swap. And down here, these alleles are going to swap. And now, once those alleles have swapped, that means if we were to pull these homologous chromosomes apart, our sister chromatids, they're no longer exact copies of each other. The sister chromatids now have different alleles. No longer are our sister chromatids exact copies of each other. We would actually refer to these as recombinant chromosomes because they have swapped some genetic information. In metaphase one, the homologous chromosomes are going to line up along 
the metaphase plate. And that is very simply right in the center of the cell, just like how it occurred in mitosis, except now they are lining up in double file. They have that tetrad that was formed. And because they formed that tetrad, it is the pair of chromosomes that is going to line up along the metaphase plate. And the way that they orient themselves in metaphase is independent of each other. This we refer to as called independent assortment, which states that the way that one homologous pair lines up has no impact upon how the other homologous pair will line up. I just wanted to take a quick aside to explain independent assortment a little bit better visually using cards. Now we must remember that each sexually reproducing organism is going to get a set of chromosomes from the male parent and from the female parent. For this, I'm going to use a suits of cards as our demonstration for the different chromosomes that could come from each parent. I can't use all the suits because that would be four sets of chromosomes. So we're only going to use two sets of chromosomes or two suits, which we're going to use hearts and spades to demonstrate how those chromosomes can line up in metaphase one. I'm going to use just aces and twos because, because our cell only had two different types of chromosomes. So I'm only going to use aces and twos. And they can line up where we could have a heart on the left and a spade on the right, a heart on the left and a spade on the right, which would demonstrate that all of the chromosomes that came from one parent would go in one direction in anaphase one and the chromosomes from the other parent would go in the opposite direction. But they don't have to line up this way. Chromosome one could line up where the heart actually is on the right and the spades is on the left. And that has no impact upon chromosome number two. Our second chromosome is still hearts on the left and spades on the right. They are sorting independently of each other. And because each chromosome is what we would call a gene linkage group, that means that all of the genes that are on chromosome number one sort independently to the genes that are on chromosome number two. Neither set of genes has an impact upon the other set. And that means that we have this extreme amount of variation. For two different sets of chromosomes, we happen to have two to the second different number of combinations, which would end up being four. But if we were to add another pair of chromosomes, our third chromosome, and because they sort independently of each other, where it could be a heart on the left and a spade on the right, or vice versa, it could line up this way, we end up not with two to the second number of combinations, but we end up with two to the third different numbers of combinations, which these different homologous pairs can line up or orient themselves in metaphase one, which is going to impact the way that they are separated in anaphase one, thus having an impact upon the final gametes that we can produce. The number of different orientations that the homologous pairs can orient themselves in metaphase one is two raised to the power of the number of homologous chromosomes that are present within that organism's cells thus increasing the different combinations of gametes or the different variations of gametes that this organism can produce. The chromosomes all line up independently, which is going to be important for when we separate them out in anaphase one. In anaphase one, our homologous chromosomes are pulled apart towards the opposite sides of the cell. So now our homologous chromosomes got pulled apart. And because they lined up independently of each other, we now are shuffling also the way that the chromosomes are getting separated out, the entirety of the chromosome, leading us to telophase one, 
where the spindle apparatus is going to disintegrate, two new nuclei are going to form, the chromosomes are going to decondense, the cell is going to divide in telophase one, so cytokinesis takes place during telophase one, and lastly, the result is we have two haploid cells. These cells no longer have homologous pairs of chromosomes. They don't have a pair of chromosomes anymore because that is what got pulled apart in anaphase one. Our chromosomes are going to be now separated. We don't have a pair of chromosomes anymore. This is not a pair of chromosomes. These two chromosomes don't have the same genes. This chromosome and this chromosome have the same genes but they're no longer within the same nucleus. They have been separated out, and so when our cells divide, these cells are now haploid, each cell only containing one set of genes. And then the chromosomes are going to decondense back into the form of chromatin, which leads us to meiosis two, prophase two. The nuclear envelope is going to disintegrate again. The chromosomes are going to condense and our spindle apparatus is going to form. And now we're going to recondense our chromosomes. We're going to get rid of our nuclei and we are going to reform that spindle apparatus. Meiosis II looks very similar to mitosis because we are now just separating out sister chromatids. As we no longer have homologous chromosomes to separate out, we are actually just following steps that are very similar to what occurs in mitosis. So if this looks familiar, that's a good thing. Next, metaphase two, the chromosomes are going to line up along the metaphase plate. And just like in metaphase, they are going to line up in a single file right along the metaphase plate. Anaphase two is where our chromosomes are now going to be pulled apart. And we can refer to those chromosomes at that moment as daughter chromosomes. Right here, the daughter chromosomes get pulled apart based upon the fact that the spindle apparatus shortens because the microtubules actually break down a little bit and they shorten. And that is how the daughter chromosomes are pulled apart is by the spindle apparatus shortening that the microtubules pulling those different daughter chromosomes toward the opposite pole. And lastly, telophase two, our new nuclei are going to form. The spindle apparatus is going to break down. The chromosomes are going to decondense. And again, just like in telophase one, in telophase two, the cell undergoes cytokinesis and we now are left with four genetically unique haploid cells. So let's see this happen. Spindle apparatus breaks down, new nuclei form, and our cells are now all separated out. And if you look closely, you can see that each of our daughter chromosomes are slightly different. None have the exact same alleles. Yes, the same genes exist within every single one of these cells. Each cell contains a daughter chromosome that came from one of the homologous pairs. And so these cells all have the exact same genes, but they have a unique combination of the alleles for these different chromosomes. And then lastly, these chromosomes would decondense back into chromatin, which I'm not showing right now because I really wanted you to be able to see the way that each of these different chromosomes is unique. So in summary, Sexual reproduction is going to require specialized cells, which are called gametes. There are two types of gametes, the sperm and the egg. And to produce a gamete it requires a special process called meiosis to form a gamete that is haploid, only one set of each chromosome. The homologous chromosomes are going to swap some genetic information during the process of prophase one when crossing over occurs, and some alleles are going to be swapped between the different chromosomes. And the homologous pairs of chromosomes will line up independently of each other in metaphase one. 
And that's really important because if the homologous chromosomes didn't line up independently of each other, that would result in an extremely large decrease in variation in our gametes. Too many of the gametes would be alike each other, which would mean that we don't have that variation. The important thing is that at the end of all of this, is we form gametes which are unique. And that is how we have a massive increase in variation across sexually reproducing organisms, all because of this process called meiosis. That is it for this time. Until next time, be awesome, stay awesome.